we still have to use Bitcoin. And we, like I said, we love Bitcoin and we have a huge experience of running Bitcoin solutions. But the cool thing is that we managed to find a way to empower our clients with the capabilities of Bitcoin, which are truly unique. And here, Bitcoin, the protocol, right? With the Bitcoin capability. So all of the benefit with none of the corresponding risk because we de-risk completely the volatility of Bitcoin by holding whatever assets our clients required to hold. And we have a bunch of sophisticated, not only technology parts that make this work, but also from the logistical as well as the regulatory. You grew up hearing stories about friends or family members that were saving for a down payment on the house and ended up buying a TV because it's a, you know, a seven to one deflation. You lost six sevenths of your purchasing power, which is incredible. And what was it uh, due to? Money printing. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, welcome everybody to a new episode of the Bitcoin Equity Stokes. Uh, today, uh, I have with me Jose from uh, Ibex, not the Ibex, that we know from traditional finance, but uh, a crypto IBEX. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, Jose, and about IBEX and uh, your business model. Hi, uh, thank you, Jad, uh, and uh, happy to be here with you today, uh, sharing a little bit of, about our story and the knowledge we've captured so far. So first of all, I'm founder and CEO of IBEX. IBEX is started off as an OTC desk in 2018 for the Central American market. And currently, you know, with the Salvador news of Bitcoin becoming legal tender there, we pivoted into a lightning company. And currently we're, we're delivering fintech on lightning. That's what we like to say. And we can go, go into a little bit of what that means and how we're seeing the protocols, both lightning and Bitcoin at this point in time. Okay, so um, perhaps before going through your business model, can you tell me a little bit about uh, yourself, how you went into crypto and then to Bitcoin and Lightning and your whole personal experience, I would say, uh, and conviction yeah. part of things? Yeah, absolutely. So I was born and raised in Guatemala, so that put me in kind of a unique situation with regards to Bitcoin. I first found out about Bitcoin in 2012. I was going down a deep rabbit hole of Google searches and Bitcoin came up. Don't even remember what I was searching for at the time, but I do remember finding the white paper, reading it. And <clears throat> just because of life experiences, I, I had experienced, I was on the wrong end of a bank bankruptcy in Guatemala. So <laughs> that was interesting. Okay. And also we had experienced extremely high inflation during the 80s when I was growing up. And so to me, the value proposition of Bitcoin was immediately obvious. When I read the white paper, a money that cannot be printed, a money that cannot be confiscated, or <clears throat> that you don't need to depend on a third party to hold the safe, it was music to my ears. I loved it from the start. Um, unfortunately, being 2012, I was, I was dumb enough not to mine, even though I had downloaded the Bitcoin core client. I just never like started mining. And, and I always just wanted to buy it. But again, being from Guatemala, I then ran into the trouble that I couldn't open uh, an account or even send money actually to the empty Gox, which was the exchange at the time. And so... I was one of the first users in local Bitcoins in Guatemala, if not the first, I think I was the first, because there was nobody there, so I couldn't purchase it. Um, <clears throat> cut to 2017, I'm doing some day trading stuff, and I reconnect with uh, Bitcoin at that point in time. And I believe Japan had recognized it as currency or something along those lines in 2017. Yeah. And it kind of lit a fire under me that I needed to get into Bitcoin. But Bitcoin, next day, I was, it had a drop of 50%. So I bought, bought a local top. And then I started to really learn about Bitcoin. 
And the more I learned about it, the more I fell in love with it. And I started putting in more cash to it, more cash to it. Um, then I started to like take money from the day trading activities and just putting it into Bitcoin um, until I ran out of cash. At which point I decided with my brother, we were doing this with my brother, we decided, you know, this is too important to just sit passively as hodlers. We want to be more active in the space and we want to build a business here. And so then we went into debt to build a business in Bitcoin. Okay. So, yeah. You raised a, a lot of very interesting uh, topics, but mm -hmm. the one that is the most interesting to me is your Guatemalan experience. Yeah, I'm not aware or familiar with the whole with everything you describe about how infl high inflation in Guatemala, about banks uh, going bankrupt, and can can you put a little bit of uh, history around it? How how did it happen? What what were the major events that happened there that Bitcoin could have solved? At least that's what you thought when you read the yeah. the white paper. Absolutely. So first, the high inflation. So between, I believe, 1982 and 90, 1987, the Guatemalan Quetzal got the value from parity with the dollar because it was being artificially controlled. You, you had capital controls at that point in time in, in Guatemala. It started to free float, and then it quickly got to 7 to 1, which is around where we are today to this day. So... It was a period of tremendously high inflation. You grew up hearing stories about uh, friends or family members that were saving for a down payment on the house and ended up buying a TV and that type of stuff. Oof. Because it's a you know a seven to one deflation. You you lost you know six sevenths of of your purchasing power, which is incredible. And what was it uh, due to? Money printing. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. <laughs> you know, it's our governments, we, I don't, I don't want to speak to the current governments, but at least back then, the, the general consensus is that the Guatemalan governments or presidents were elected to steal. And you just try to pick who will... Who will steal the less, the least? Okay, so so you so you were impacted if you had um, local currency in your bank account, but could you have like dollars in your bank account, or only the or both were impacted? You could, depending on the industry. So depending on your business, you could have either dollars in your bank account or dollars outside. It wasn't really allowed so for example when you were traveling you were allowed something like you could purchase two thousand dollars or something like that to fly with i think maybe a thousand per person or something along those lines and that's why you could actually exchange and um, it was like that for a long time so there were strong capital controls around this um, you know, after 1987 into the 90s and 2000s, you started to see, because it was already free floating, you started to see a lot more openness around having multiple currencies. Today, uh, Guatemala, I believe, is one of the few countries that let you, lets you specify um, the payment terms in different currencies. So you could actually do a contract in euros, do a contract in USD, do a contract in yens today to be payable. Okay, so interesting much. because, um, I mean, I lived the same experience as uh, because I'm Lebanese origin. Yeah. And, um, and in Lebanon, the same happened with a devaluation of 97% of your currency. Yeah, but it, it impacted uh, both your Lebanese pounds accounts and your U.S. dollars accounts. So there was like a freeze, wherever a currency you had, even euros, there was a total freeze because yeah. of the money printing that was organized. So people, so the politicians would steal the money 
on um, extensive uh, government spending and stuff like that. It's, I remember I had researched when it happened to see how a company, how a, how a country comes out of this kind of situation. And I had looked into Argentina, which is still like struggling, and Cyprus, where they had like this type of um, problems during the global financial crisis. But I didn't uh, see Guatemala under my radar. Okay, interesting. So, so, so uh, you had like all this experience firsthand about excessive money printing and the problems that come with it. And yeah. um, and then you you adopted Bitcoin, and then you started wanting to develop a business. Was it only Bitcoin, or you craved into other cryptos? Oh no, I I did my what they call the shitcoin tour of duty in, <laughs> yeah, in Bitcoin. So I, I dabbled in a lot. You know, at, at the start. You you don't really understand what you're looking at, or at least we didn't with my brother and. And we were looking at Bitcoin and uh, its monetary proposition, uh, store of value, etc. cetera. Um, and we really liked that. Then we, at that point in time, I believe it was just before the block size wars in Bitcoin, right? And you also had Litecoin alongside it, which was promising more transaction ability, um, faster confirmation times. And so we thought it, it could work like in tandem kind of like at that point it was silver to gold right gold, the okay, analogy yeah. um then of course ethereum we looked into it we bought ethereum we bought a bunch of other quote unquote tokens or icos cuz the ico craze was going on we were looking at really as a new way for for companies or yeah companies in the in jurisdictions like ours, like Guatemala, to be able to seek financing outside of the banking loans, which is all we have really available in our country, is loans or your own money. And so we were very excited about that. Of course, a lot of scams in this space. We were trying to evaluate what could not be a scam, put in a little bit of money into that because we believe in free markets we believe in capital allocation or capital distribution so we believed in all of that most of it turned out to be scams of course and so most of the icos and so yeah then we just started focusing on bitcoin Okay, so you came back to Bitcoin and how did you come up with the business idea and what is your business idea, basically? So when we started out, it was just really about bringing access to Bitcoin. We believed, so we never went out of Bitcoin. We just were doing stuff in parallel with Bitcoin. We just wanted to the protocol help, right, in whatever way we could. So we said, what is most needed now? What's most needed at that point in time, we believed was on and off ramps. And that's why uh, we went to Guatemala. I was living in, in the Netherlands at the point when I was buying Bitcoin, but then went back to Guatemala to open up uh, an OTC desk to get Guatemalans an easy, safe, secure way to to purchase Bitcoin and not only purchase, but also have the off ramp in case you need it because no, no investment is good. I, I don't think, or it's not as attractive if there's no easy way to cash out. Okay. So, um, so you started your OTC service business and mm -hmm. then, and then in 2021, we had already started looking into Lightning as a way to improve our customers' experience and kind of pivot away from an OTC desk into a more retail-facing product. And we, we were early believers in Lightning even before the SegWit got adopted. So <clears throat> we, we liked it. And then the news broke out that 
El Salvador was adopting Tigo Tender. Now, we had at this point been in business for three years, pretty much, and been in Bitcoin for four years, really using it, right? And we knew a lot of the shortcomings, specifically around transactionability. Bitcoin works on chain, great as a store of value, but it really, really has a lot of shortcomings as a transactional currency. And so we knew the biggest challenge was going to get businesses to accept Bitcoin in a fast, easy, secure manner. And we also knew that if it's legal tender and you're a multinational company that needs to accept Bitcoin, you don't want to keep it. So we needed to bring to market a solution to convert the Bitcoin you're receiving instantly into fiat. And that's basically what we built in El Salvador. Alongside that, we ha we were building our own technology, right? Because the one thing is the, let's call it point of sale system, where you can deliver to the merchants an easy way to collect payments in Bitcoin with instant conversion into fiat. But the other part that you needed was the actual uh, running of the Lightning infrastructure. And so at the same time as we're developing the retail product, we're developing the infrastructure product. And because we did it in tandem and not as a monolithic uh, solution, we were able to help the Chivo wallet actually launch on time. And we were running the Chivo Lightning infrastructure for the th first three months of operation. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and the convertibility from uh, Bitcoin to fiat. How do you, what's your solution to make it instantly and to be able to, to have it on your back account? Because this is like the most technical part, like moving yeah. uh, on and off, try right, to, yeah. to DeFi. So there we have partnerships with liquidity partners, depending on jurisdiction. And so we integrate with them through APIs and we are able to hold a basic capital pools in, in multiple currencies at the same time and and be converting instantly as transactions happen on the Lightning Network. We back them up on with our liquidity partners or even ourselves, depending on the situation and the requirements of our customers. Okay, so your clients are uh, retail or is it point of sales or... Uh, what's your business uh, value proposition? Is it towards what's your public? What's your customers? Yeah. So even though we started doing the POS retail application, and we do still have it uh, and run it in a limited fashion, mostly for El Salvador and some other clients that have onboarded globally. Uh, globally, we don't do the fiat conversion. We basically just pass along the Satoshis to whatever wallet they want. Um, but in our core product is that delivering fintech on Lightning. So over the last two years, two and a half years, uh, since we've been operating our Lightning infrastructure, we've noticed that there's this very real, very strong value proposition of leveraging the Bitcoin protocol and the Lightning protocol as a pure settlement network as a settlement mechanism for global value transfers. And we can be way more efficient than the current settlement technology that is out there because transactions happen instantly, because there's instant settlement, because we can be in and out of currencies instantly as well. And we have the liquidity availability, so the depth of market that's liquid enough to actually facilitate this between multiple currencies. And so that is the core of the technology we've built. We, we bring the lightning expertise and we combine it with the um, money logistics expertise that we learned as an OTC desk and managing liquidity there. We combine that into one product where our customers uh, potentially can receive payments uh, over the Lightning Network, or even can move themselves money cross-border 
without ever needing to touch Bitcoin. Because for some of our clients, it's important to not be exposed to the volatility risk of Bitcoin. Okay, so basically you're competing with the traditional uh, payment uh, system infrastructure by uh, providing instant settlement uh, in a much uh, quicker way, basically, yeah. instead of waiting uh, one week or two weeks, sometimes for the settlement for traditional payments as solutions, right? Yeah, exactly. More than competing with the payment infrastructure, we believe they're, they are our customers and we treat them as such. We help them solve problems that they themselves have moving money globally. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. So you would go to a Western Union or to a Visa or MasterCard and uh, propose to them to use your solution as a, more, as a quicker and more efficient way for instant settlement of all these uh, cross-border uh, transactions, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, in this space, um, I've heard of Strike from Jack Matters, who does something similar. How do you differentiate yourself from uh, what Strike is doing? Um, unfortunately, I, I can't speak too deeply about what Strike does because we don't really um, look at their solution too deeply other than we understand what Send Global does and we come across each other from time to time. I think what makes us different is, first of all, our, our strong focus on bringing this to institutions. So we are B2B first, I would say. We don't really have a retail app. Like I said, we, we had the POS going on for a while and we still do, but that's not the core of the business and that's not what we're building. I think our money logistics capabilities, so bringing end-to-end -end solutions to our customers and the customizability of our solution, because we are really agnostic in terms of who handles what. Our core expertise lies in the Lightning technology and in the technology to facilitate instant execution. And so we... What we've built is a robust set of APIs that you can consume as needed. So if, for example, you already have an exchange partner who you like to work with, we can work with them. We can route the transactions instructions if you want or not, or we can help set up your solution as you need. And that's where the delivering FinTech on Lightning comes in for us. Okay, so basically you're, um, you're only focusing on the um, FinTech part in the sense that you're, uh, you're focusing only on the technological solution and your service is a pure technological service and uh, all the customer handling, the licensing, the uh, regulatory Coverage is covered by your clients with their existing uh, licenses and uh, abilities to uh, do these payments, correct? Depending on the client and depending on the jurisdiction. This is a very <laughs> complicated world, as you may imagine, just regulatorily speaking. Uh, but yes, uh, in some jurisdictions, we work with clients that already have their own licenses and such. Uh, in others, like for example, in El Salvador, we're fully licensed, not only with the Bitcoin license from the Central Bank of El Salvador, but we also have the new licenses regarding digital assets. And so we, depending, it, it, it's really specific to jurisdictions, how much or not we're involved in, in that uh, regulatory part of it. Okay. And um the fact that you're based in Latin America, I'm wondering if there's not a big value proposition there because you have a lot of remittances, a lot of money flowing in and out from the U.S. to all these countries around there. Um, how, how, how is this, how is your technology fit for the region in which you're operating your business? Absolutely. So I think here we, uh, the best is uh, 
thing to do is to come up with a couple of examples. So I'll give you one. One of our customers is Osmo Wallet. So shout out to Osmo, I guess. But but they're a great partner. We're we're growing along together. They are basically basically building a wallet for the Central American market where it has this Lightning and Bitcoin functionality, but it also as well has the ability to hold hold um, balances in local currencies. So Guatemala and Quetzal, US dollars for El Salvador, uh, colones for, for Costa Rica, and so on and so forth. But the cool thing is you can have your funds in Quetzales and go to a store that accepts Lightning in El Salvador, right? And pay directly from your Quetzales to the merchant who's probably going to be receiving dollars instantly if they're using our payment solution. So it's this facilitation of those type of transactions that is starting to become really powerful. And when you move on to the business use case, it it becomes even more powerful. And what I mean here is now we have the capability of having a, a Guatemalan business pay their supplier in Mexico instantly through the network. And most and usually with a way better exchange rate than they would find if they went through dollars. And quicker because I suppose um, in Latin America, transferring money between countries, although they are near, it must be less smooth than other regions of the world. Well, it's, it's the problem becomes when you start having to do money transfers between currencies that do not have a natural trading pair. What do I mean by not having a natural trading pair is, for example, they don't, for example, you can't go from Guatemala and Quetzales to Colones from Costa Rica, even though we're very close, or even to Mexican pesos. So you first have to convert into dollars to then go into pesos or Colones. And also the banking system is set up in such a way that the international settlement mostly is done with dollars to this day between these countries. And so we're leveraging the Bitcoin's protocol really as a, as a global financial settlement database where we can point to with any transaction and then come out on the other end with the corresponding or the needed uh, currency. Okay, and you just have to plug for each currency with the liquidity provider that gives you, so you're competing not only on the on the speed of execution and settlement, but also on the spreads you're paying yeah. in and out and uh, converting, going through the US dollars and then going through all the intermediaries. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, myself, uh, when I first discovered Bitcoin, Mm -hmm. It was uh, what, in, what what I really liked about it was the fact that um, I didn't have to convert anymore my euros to dollars mm -hmm. than to Lebanese pounds every time I was going from France to Lebanon to visit, to visit my parents. And uh, I said to myself that would be a good value proposition if everybody accepted Bitcoin. And yeah. uh, this is what you're solving, basically. You're, yeah facilitating not only Bitcoin, but also all the other currencies in a very efficient manner. Yeah. And, 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 um, and how do you deal with capital controls and this kind of restrictions? Well, <laughs> we basically don't touch countries at this point with capital controls or with strong capital controls. We uh, operate in a fully regulated industry in a fully regulated way. We have KYC, AML, compliance, same as any other, that's called fintech company out there that does this. And yeah, we, ad we adhere to all of those controls so far. And we basically are geared to service businesses, primarily not individuals. So if like we'll service somebody like Osmo that will go then to retail uh, customers, but we won't do the retail directly. 
Um, so yeah, for now, unfortunately, it's still a little bit of there. There is uh, people that are there are jurisdictions that are being excluded. It's not because we want to, but as the technology evolves, we think we'll be able to solve for those issues as well. Okay, interesting. I I really like the uh, how. Uh, you're solving all these uh, cross-border payments and all these uh, local inefficiencies. And um, I want to take a step a step back perhaps with you and talk about um, a little bit the virtues of Bitcoin. So what, what you saw and what you are developing is something that will be immediately useful for uh, a lot of people and a lot of customers that you service. But in general, you have, you see a lot of backlash and the most recent one was from the ECB who wrote uh, a, a big block uh, raising a lot of issues around Bitcoin and even claiming that Bitcoin is going to disappear. Finally, it's the second blog post they, they, where they, they have put out there. Um, the last one was, I think, in 2022, end of 22, and the lowest, I would say, of the bear market. And each time they come up with one, they cannot like time it worth because the Bitcoin <laughs> price rises so much afterwards. So, so if you look at the arguments of the ECB in general, what, what and and you see all these um, negative views from. Um, a very respected regulator, at least for now, until people realize that their whole business is money printing. But uh, how do you react and how do you see when you compare it to uh, all the goods that you're doing in solving these problems with your technology? Yeah. Well, first of all, I have to say it's very disheartening to read something like that. And some places... Something that, that as you read it, and if you do any sort of work within this industry, so anybody that's involved in the Bitcoin industry, whether it be a miner, whether it, whether it be a lightning node uh, operator, whether you're a custodial solution and you understand the technology, the first few paragraphs that you read, you understand these people either did know nothing of the technology or are willfully disregarding any type of uh, of study out there, just willfully disregarding. And that's that's really sad to see coming from what I suppose or what I hope are very capable, very intelligent individuals, uh, you know? So that's, that's the first like visceral reaction, right? <laughs> <laughs> now to go into some of the points they raised, um, first of all, if they're saying it, it has no utility, they obviously do not understand databases. They do not understand, you know, the value proposition of having the first and only global financial settlement database that is truly agnostic. Because here's the thing, the problem with, with payments, so for, for most people, payments are local. But the fact of the matter is that commerce is global. And if you look at, you know, let's go through our clothing right now, made in Taiwan, made in uh, Vietnam, made in El Salvador, made, like we'll take a tour just going over the stuff we have around us. We go on a world tour. And all of that money somehow had to get, that we spent locally, had to get back to the manufacturers somehow. So commerce is global. So even though you play pay local, your money goes global very quickly. And then that world of global settlement, the problem is how do you coordinate, right? Because it's a world where nobody trusts anybody. And in a world where nobody trusts nobody, what do you trust? Well, you trust what is trustless. And that is Bitcoin. And that is the power of a truly global financial settlement database and why it cannot be replicated. And so when I, and this is something that we're doing today, like I mentioned, the 
the sending uh, payments, supplier payments from Guatemala to Mexico can happen today, is happening today. So, you, and we're getting faster settlement times with a tighter spread, as you mentioned. So it's a win-win across the board. So it's say, signaling this is the superior technology. And to willfully disregard that, it's, it's mind-blowing. And then you get into their other arguments against, you know, the ESG argument of energy and all of this stuff. And again, you, you, can, you can see their willful ignorance of energy generation and of what Bitcoin mining is. They just willfully disregard it. Bitcoin mining is nothing more than the equivalent of a very sophisticated firewall for any other database. What the miners are fundamentally doing is they are <clears throat> validating that the uh, information in the Bitcoin database is tamper proof and absolutely correct. And that's what they're doing. Same as any other database in the world. And if we want to compare apples to apples, then let's compare the Bitcoin database energy consumption to the energy consumption of the global, because remember, this is global, to the global financial database structure. And let's, let's run the numbers. And let's find out who's actually spending more energy. Yeah, actually, there's a French company who did this exercise, the value chain, and it was like 52 to 60 times less energy consuming and much more efficient. I'm going to try to play the devil's advocate <laughs> and try to, to push a little bit further, further yeah. the ECB arguments. Yeah. And they would claim that the digital euro will mm -hmm. do exactly the same without any energy or additional energy consumption. So we don't need Bitcoin, we'll have the digital euro and everybody will use it worldwide. Uh, <laughs> I would say good luck. The moment China is gonna be, a, be willing to hold the ECB or, or the euro in their balance sheet or Russia or the US, because remember these are countries to country negotiations, right? And that's the thing about global commerce. And that's where the trust comes in. And the fact of the matter is none of these governments trust the other government. So whose database are you trusting here? Are you seriously suggesting, I would say to the ECB, that the Chinese government is going to feel comfortable holding a European coin that they can be blocked out of with a, the flip of a switch? Are you going to do that with Russia? Are you going to do that with any other country? I mean, the euro today is not being widely held abroad. Like it might work within the euro zone, but even like getting euros in Guatemala, it's complicated. And you're asking this to be a global thing? Good luck. Maybe, yes. I'm not going to say definitely no, but the amount of political will and goodwill that you're going to need to even attempt such a thing, I believe is, is too high to execute on today. So, and the thing is, if the euro is going to go into China, right, and the Chinese government is going to run on euros, because I find that highly unlikely. Chinese government will want their Chinese yen. And so there has to be some holding of yens, Chinese digital yens and French or whatever European euro on both sides, both on the Chinese side and on the European side. Now you have to hold the digital yen. And are you? Are you really? because that is the trade-off there. Now, everybody kind of plays nice with the dollar because you have the US treasuries, which are to a certain extent liquid. And if you actually hold them tradable at any point in time. Now with Russia, we just saw how tradable things are. And I don't know how many countries want to repeat that experiment. 
So I find it, like I said, highly unlikely that that is possible from the geopolitical spectrum. But then are you selling the idea that it's going to take no energy to secure your database? Is that what you're telling me here? Because today, Swift, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Visa, MasterCard, they spend millions and billions of dollars just in securing their database infrastructure against hackers. But you're going to go in there and do it free? Uh, you might have some technology I don't know what about. I saw I was reading in news that uh, HSBC had uh, 15 billion hack attempts per day, or it was JP Morgan, something like that. Yeah. And yeah, I agree that it would be like an additional layer of security that you would need to bring up. It's, it's always interesting to have like a Bitcoiners discussion on this topic. I, I don't know how to say it, but it's like when, you, when you're in the Bitcoin business, you become like a CEO yeah. and running a company, but also like a geo, geopolitical expert and a money expert. And like, I find it tackling so many horizons at the same time. How do you deal uh, between like running a company on Bitcoin as a CEO compared to like just running, uh, I don't know, a bookstore or, or a tech company or just if you were like running a, a traditional fintech company, you don't have like this additional layer of food, of backlashes and stuff. How do you manage yeah. to, to surf both worlds, I would say, while building your company? Well, you know, the thing is a couple of, I would say months back when we started really wrapping our hands around the power of this technology. And this is where I, usually when I talk about Bitcoin, I'm talking about Bitcoin from the database standpoint. So from its blockchain, not necessarily, I don't talk too much about Bitcoin, the asset, and as a monetary, you know, as a currency, the currency discussion is fraught with a lot of discussion and stuff. Unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of things that you can say around Bitcoin as a currency. And by the way, I'm a big believer in, like I said, no, no printing, no confiscation. Uh, so, but the power of this technology as a global database, I think it's very little known and very little talked about because it's such an esoteric subject, I would say. It's just so specific. And if you're not in the weeds like we are trying to move money globally or trying to move value globally and trying to find out what the most efficient technology to do this in, you don't really go there. And... Yeah, so what you're saying, there's B, small B, Bitcoin's the asset, mm -hmm. and big B, uh, Bitcoin's the network, and you can deal with one without dealing with the other or uh, vice versa. Well, you, uh, us ourselves, we, we still have to use Bitcoin. And we, like I said, we love Bitcoin and we have a huge experience of running Bitcoin solutions. But the cool thing is that we managed to find a way to empower our clients with the capabilities of Bitcoin, which are truly unique. And here, Bitcoin, the protocol, right? With the Bitcoin capabilities. So all of the, let's say, the benefit with none of the corresponding risk, because we de-risk completely the volatility of Bitcoin by holding whatever assets our clients required to hold. And we have a bunch of sophisticated, not only technology parts that make this work, but also from the logistical as well as the regulatory uh, standpoints. So, so it's really three things that you have to get really good at and, and find solutions, which is, yeah, the lightning technology, but that's only one component. Then you need good understanding of money logistics and how to manage capital and then finally you need good regulatory understanding as well so okay interesting 
Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. It was a very interesting uh, discussion, and uh, I hope to see you soon on the show. Whenever you have like anything new that comes out or any announcement, feel free to, to reach out. And, so uh, it was uh, a great discussion. Thanks a lot for uh, coming on the show, Jose. Thank you, Jad. It was a pleasure. Take care.